Is the Bank of Canada doing the right thing? Are they making up new terminology like dovish and hawkish? Well, we talk about all these things with our good friend and mortgage broker, Dion Begg, right after this. Friends, here we are with our favorite mortgage broker in all of the land, Mr. Dion Begg. How you doing, my man? Hey, Gare. It's another Monday. I'm happy. I'm good. Had a good weekend. This is another Monday. That's all right. That's all right. It, it's we've had a good weekend here, actually. I don't. I know. I know you know my father. Uh, we hosted a large charity event on the weekend to raise money for the charity that he uh, represents. We had a we had a great weekend here, actually, raising lots of okay. money and awareness. Yeah, it was really good. Good, good to hear. Um, I watched the uh, Rugby World Cup Grand Final, which you, did you also watch it? I didn't watch it, but I heard the news. The, one, one point was the difference, right? One point, New Zealand uh, lost by one point to South Africa. Good game, not very uh, exciting game. Um, a lot of, uh, I guess, slower play, but uh, two very strong teams. I, I grew up in Australia, um, and I actually did live for one year of my life when I was very young in New Zealand. So by default, I was cheering for New Zealand. They lost, but still, good game. And uh, they'll be back in another four years. There you go. I like it. Spoken yeah. like a true fan. Back in another four years. <laughs> I like it. I like it. You know, it's interesting. And, and this thought just popped into my head. Many years ago, my dad asked me to uh, help out uh, in raising funds in the fact that, hey, I, I know you like talking on stage. We need you to become an auctioneer. So oh, that's so, my, is so that what you did this past weekend? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and then of course, you know, I always have to remind myself on how to do it. And I'm going through like all the YouTube videos and stuff, right? right. And 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 because my 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 YouTube channel knows that uh, or my account knows that I love real estate, it always brings me back to Australia when they do uh, auctions for houses there. I always find that oh, intriguing. Yes. So one of my very good friends is one of the most successful auctioneers in Australia. I'll uh, I'll send you some of his videos. He's a character. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Do you, okay, we we didn't plan to talk about this, but uh, is is that it? Is that a system you think would be adopted elsewhere, like in Canada, or let's just keep it in Australia? Well, I, I think there has been discussion of it, and uh, it hasn't had a big uptake. From what I can see here in Canada, obviously it doesn't really exist. But what I can say is in Australia, it has been a very common way to sell, obviously in a particular market, and that is a seller's market, right? And that is because what happens in, say, the years like we had in the year 2021, when there's such a frenzy and there's this fear of FOMO, um, you know, you're going to get multiple offers. Uh, in Canada and in Ontario in particular, they do a lot of, uh, I guess, blind bidding, so to speak, which is what you call your offer night. And the difference with an offer night versus uh, uh, an auction is that the other buyers in the offer night are not aware of what the other competitors are offering. Uh, whereas in an, an open auction where you're effectively just yelling out your bid or putting up your hand for a higher number, it's clearly visible. And actually, back in my day when I was a real estate agent in Australia, I did attend some of these on behalf of some of my clients and uh, ended up purchasing some property at auction. But yeah, you end up, it always comes down to, you know, you start with five or six people, you get down to two people, and then those two people, me and the other guy just seem to be pushing that price up. And we're kind of looking at each other. I remember looking at each other going, are you really going to go again? Are you really going to go again? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's the game you have to play. But I mean, um, at the end of the day, I think it's probably a pretty good outcome for the seller overall. Yeah, I think so. It it was it's definitely intriguing in the way they do it there. And and if so, as as licensed realtors, our legislation is changing uh, this December. In fact, so 2023, and in part of that legislation and what they're writing into it, in fact, uh, there's there's three professionals that can legally represent a seller and a, a, a or a let me let me rephrase that three professionals that can represent a seller in selling a property or disposition of property in Ontario we're talking one as yeah. we all know is the real estate agent yes licensed real estate agent the second is a lawyer and do you okay. know the th the third person uh I'm gonna say a trustee no 
uh, they can they can represent, but they can't sign off and sell the, all the documents in a sense okay. as as a lawyer can uh, from from that perspective. Uh, perspective, a licensed auctioneer can oh. sell a house in Ontario. So does that auctioneer that auctioneer doesn't have to be licensed in real estate? Just not in to real be an estate. Auctioneer. Just a licensed auctioneer. So they're just selling an asset, like they'd be selling a car or whatever the case or may a be. Couch. An yeah. Or a couch or a picture or whatever, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, our legislation is actually, believe it or not, moving to change that. Uh, come in, in the, we're calling it Tressa is our new legislation is coming in to change that. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, there are real estate brokers out there that will host uh, an auction style here in Ontario. I can think of a couple and, okay. um, and, and they have done it with, with great success. Uh, but it's far and few between interesting stuff. Right. Like as we go down that rabbit hole, uh, it, it, it is kind of intriguing. And, and in some cases, our legislation is also changing in the fact that if you have multiple, it's not at this moment yet, but it's, it's coming very, very soon in, in December. Uh, if you have an offer night with multiple offers, the seller can choose to disclose information mm -hmm. on all the offers. What they cannot disclose is personal information, who the offer came from and, and that type of thing. But they can disclose the deposit, of course, wow. the purchase or the offer price, uh, if there's conditions, um, mm -hmm. the deposit amount. And that has benefits to the buyer, I think less benefits to the seller. But we can talk about that when all that comes in. That's a deep yeah. conversation. And I know this for a fact, Gary, you and I have had clients who lost out on their offer on the offer night and then they find out what the thing sold for and they say to themselves ah if i had only known that mm. then i would have bumped my price by 5 grand because we could have done that and that property represented that value to to them but they weren't given the opportunity and they didn't know how high to go so yeah. it could work yeah could work both ways yeah it's it's definitely an interesting strategy that it'll be in the seller's decision of what they decide to do mm -hmm. and what they decide to disclose. And they don't have to disclose anything. They can keep it at, you know, the, the same way we've been doing it for many years, or they can open up elements of it. And, and if you, if there's, as an example, if there's five offers that have been presented to the seller, uh, all five of those buyers get to get a preview in a sense, or, or they have, they are privy to what is in those offers. Now, here's the here's the caveat. One of the five writes in the offer to say if this, I basically paraphrasing, I do not allow my the information of this offer, the contents of this offer to be disclosed to other buyers. Ah, okay. So you could have four of the five right. and that <laughs> allow their information. So it's really, really interesting. Anyways, we're going down a rabbit hole. Let's talk about what's going on here. Uh, okay. Okay. Couple of things. We, 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 we talked about in lieu of, because when we, when we did our video, the interest rate announcement hadn't happened yet from last Correct, week, yes. uh, late, late October that we're filming this October 30th. And, there were some interesting comments coming. Of course, there's no rate hike, as we all know. Uh, interesting comments coming out of out of the Bank of Canada, and maybe some terms that I don't even, you know, I don't know if they're making them up on the fly or perhaps I'm just not in the right circles to listen to them all the time. But they're talking about things like a dove and a hawk and all sorts of birds, and right. I'm used to bears and bulls and everything else. What's going on here? Yeah, sure. So I, I think we all know the bear and the bull market as it relates to the stock market. I think most of us understand that. Um, but as sort of animals, or in this case, uh, you know, birds relate to the Bank of Canada and most central banks, actually, they use this wording called dovish or hawkish. And um, what came out of last week was they were saying, look, we have had a rate pause, but the, uh, the Bank of Canada governor, Tiff, Tiff Macklem, was very hawkish in his statement. Now, what 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 does this bird mean? What does hawkish mean? So, if if any of you have been following along uh, for the last couple of months, you might have seen these this language used before. But hawkish basically means that they're still they still have an aggressive stance as it comes to in, uh, inflation and interest rates, and they are basically broadcasting that while we are where we are right now, 
market take note. We, are, we have our finger on the trigger and we are willing to increase interest rates if that is needed. Okay, And of course, that's hawkish, so the opposite of that is dovish, a less aggressive stance. Now, let's go, let's go back a couple of months ago, Gary, to uh, January, February this year, when the Bank of Canada said that next month they were likely going to pause. They actually broadcast, next month we are likely going to pause. That's that dovish type of statement that we were referring to. And you know what happened then, Gary? The, the market took confidence from that, especially when they followed through on their dovish statement. And then the real estate market roared for the first half of this year, right? So if I'm Tiff, uh, Tiff Macklem, I am trying to not have a repeat of the first half of this year. He is pausing and he is at the same time saying, I'm not going to let what happened in March, April, May, and June happen again uh, in the next couple of months. That's why they're using the language that they're using. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. It's it's kind of like talking out of both sides of your mouth at the same time, right? <laughs> you know the way. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like uh, it's almost like he's treating us like children to some extent. Meaning, you know, I'll give you I'll give you some ice cream now, but if you're not good boys and girls, then maybe next time around you won't get the ice cream. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a crazy example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's interesting. And it's I always we forget how powerful words can be or statements can mm. be, right? And yeah. um th there's there's a lot that can affect the market. And of course, you know, even even as professionals in the market or or someone that um if you're watching here, someone that you look up to or 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 you always are taking advice from, uh make sure you're getting you know, insightful advice from people that have done it before, right? Well, we've said that many, many times uh, over, over our calls. Uh, it, it's important to understand, you know, I and I'll, I'll go back to this story quite quickly. Uh, when you fall in love with the numbers and don't focus on some of the other fundamentals of a purchase, you can get yes. into trouble, right? And, and yes. when you get laser focused on just the one thing and you forget about the other things like, hey, the property that we bought had amazing investment numbers. However, it was in the middle of nowhere and it was hard to exit. Yep. yep. So you got to make sure that the person you're listening to or the person you're in conversation with uh, is asking you all the right questions. Correct. Correct. And yeah, I mean, you got to make decisions from that, not that, from a bird's eye view. Yeah, which is if we're going back to the doves and the hawks, yes, back for, back to a bird's eye view, not just the numbers, but the bigger scope. And yeah, if if, if the property's in the middle of nowhere, how does that impact your long term uh, appre appreciation and those types yeah. of things? Yeah, um, yeah. I want to you know, guess. Uh, so no, I was going to say, if I could just come back to the um, the interest rate discussion. Um, we we've spoken a couple of times about Benjamin Tao mm, and. Yes. He had some very interesting things to to say in regards to uh, interest rates and where he believes they should be and where we're going to land. So I, I think it's worth sharing that his his prediction is that we're probably going to be somewhere near normal, whatever that new normal is, by summertime of next year. Now, is he right? I'm not sure, but he has been correct in the past. And what he is saying is that right now we're at an interest rate of 5%, the Bank of Canada overnight rate. And he believes that the new normal for us will be a 3% rate. And that could be happening as of, say, middle of next year or towards the end of next year. Now, that would be a significant drop, you know, two percentage points. We, we've had a run up of nearly five basis, 500 basis points this year. If we could drop yeah. by 200 in one year, that would be tremendous. I don't think that'll happen in a year. But if we end up at 3% at the Bank of Canada rate, I just want to be clear with everybody, that doesn't mean that's the rate at which you will be able to borrow money for your mortgage. The retail branch rate is usually somewhere between 1% and 2% higher than the, the Bank of Canada overnight rate. So if we're at, say, 3%, it's likely that the retail lending rate on mortgages is somewhere going, to, going to be somewhere around that 4.5% rate. Uh, and you know, as I look back at the, the history of Canadian uh, uh, interest rates, Prior to 2008, and that's an important milestone because that's prior to the global financial crisis and this quantitative easing uh, drive that we went on for the last 15 years or so, 
you know, the, the average interest rate prior to then was somewhere in that 5% range. So we may be returning to that type of number based on, based on what he, he's saying there. Yeah, that, that, that's good. And that, that aligns with what, you know, you and I have been saying in the past and, and, uh, we get this insight from reading and listening to people like Benjamin Tall. Yeah. We, we tend to feel like that 2025, uh, year we'll see four and a half, you know, four and three quarters, somewhere around there. And that that's right in line with all that. And, and I like, I like you, you had sent me a message last week yeah, and you, you know, I love AI. In fact, my oh, yeah. the, a new business I launched is the, the names incorporated in that and uh, share with us what uh, Benjamin Tall thought if uh, AI had been involved in the interest rate decision-making. Yeah. So what he was saying is that if, if AI was involved, which means you take out the, um, uh, emotional human factor and just look at the data, then, then he's saying that AI would have stopped interest rate hikes at 4.5. So half a percent ago mm -hmm. is when AI would have made that decision, uh, taking out, you know, that, that human factor. And that, that human factor is, you know, the bond traders plus the humans that work at the Bank of Canada, not just Tiff Macklem himself, but all of the advisors and statisticians below that. And, uh, you know, Gary, I, I, it reminded me years ago, I watched this uh, Netflix documentary called Alpha Go. Have you seen this? I haven't. No. Okay. So Mr. AI, you better watch this tonight. Okay. So basically it showed many years ago, we all know that IBM created a computer that played the grandmaster in, in, uh, in chess yeah. and beat him. Um, but Go is a, uh, is a different type of board game that is a lot more complex than chess. And it was thought that there would never be a computer that could ever beat a human uh, at, at that game. And uh, again, of course, we were proved wrong. And this, uh, this documentary shows the process of how that all played out. But very interestingly, the game of Go is a very respected game in in Asia and in particular, th this was conducted in Korea. And after that machine was found to you know, be, be better than that grand master of Go, many um, Korean companies decided to include AI on their board of directors. So that in addition to all the humans who are giving their input for the direction of their company, that they would also include an emotionless AI which would only just talk the data. It doesn't mean they're removing humans altogether, but we're now talking as, as early as five years ago, um, mm. companies in Korea, Korea were having uh, AI on their board of directors. That is incredible. Mm. I got lots of thoughts about that. Uh, and that's <laughs> probably good for another video. Uh, sure. Yeah, no, that, that's insightful. I mean, it's when people use AI, uh, it's, it's, and you're right. It takes out that human element. Sometimes we, you know, I think, I think people just need that. Oh yeah. I hadn't thought about that. So let's discuss this type thing, right? It, it's almost, you know, people use it for many, many different things. Uh, I find it very insightful to create new discussion points or kind of that, that, um, you know, so it was some, many of us will have mentors or coaches because they see the blind spots. Yes. And you can use it as that, right? What, what, okay. What haven't we thought about? Uh, in a sense, um, and, and use it, you know, how about this? We're, we're, you know, we're in our real estate world and, and many people, uh, watch, uh, watch the video because of that. Why not, why not use it for some of your, you know, uh, investment, I don't want to say investment strategies or purchase decisions, but to help you make that decision. How about that? Right. Yeah, I think so. And I think, I mean, here's a quick example. <clears throat> I was helping my family plan a holiday uh, and, uh, I said, I could, I could do this all myself, or I could go to chat GPT and ask some questions about the destination that they're going to and the things that they want to see there. And it was like, wow, you can do this all collated in one shot rather than, you know, Googling 25 different pages and figuring out what the best is. So, yeah, I mean, I have really used it to help me inform the decisions that I'm making and sure that might be a trivial thing, but as things progress and as we humans get more comfortable with outsourcing that search process, then I think that it's going to be integrated in the same way that Google is a commonplace name in every household now. I think the chat GPT doesn't roll off a tongue as well, but it's likely going to be 
one of those things that is the, the future for yeah, us. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Always, always insightful. And I like that we're flying with the birds now. Uh, <laughs> remind us how to get a hold of you. Yeah, kangamortgage.ca or on Instagram at the Dion Big. There you have it, my friends. So that's Mr. Dion Beg. I'm Gary McGowan. We'll see everybody in the next video. Goodbye for now.